Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Username throwaway.345 posted on Reddit. Hey Reddit, I never thought I'd have a story to share here, but after what happened last night, I can't keep it to myself. I need to get this out and maybe someone can help me understand what the hell is going on. Here's my story. I'm a pretty average guy. I work a nine to five job, live alone in a small apartment and have a few close friends I hang out with on weekends. Nothing too exciting or out of the ordinary. I've always been a bit of a tech geek and I've spent countless hours exploring the internet. Recently, I started hearing about the dark web and got curious. Everyone knows the dark web is a creepy place filled with shady dealings and disturbing content, but my curiosity got the better of me. So I spent a few days researching how to access it safely. Armed with Tor and a good VPN, I decided to dive in one evening. It was mostly boring at first. Lots of marketplaces selling drugs, fake IDs, and stolen credit card information. I knew I was playing with fire, so I steered clear of anything that seemed too dangerous. But then I stumbled upon a forum that claimed to host live webcam feeds. The idea intrigued me, and I thought it might just be another platform for exhibitionists. Navigating through the labyrinth of links, I finally found a thread titled, Live Feeds, Real Time. The posts were filled with cryptic comments and links. One link caught my eye. It was simply labeled, Living Room to 47. My curiosity peaked, and I clicked on it. What loaded up was a grainy webcam feed of a living room that looked eerily familiar. My living room. My blood ran cold as I recognized my sofa, my coffee table, and the distinct posters on my wall. I was looking at a live feed of my own apartment. I frantically looked around the room trying to spot the camera. Nothing seemed out of place. I even waved my hand in front of my face, and there it was on the screen a delayed, pixelated version of myself waving back. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to comprehend what I was seeing. How could this be happening? I noticed something even more disturbing. There were about 200 people watching the feed. The chat was alive with comments. When is he going to bed? Does he ever leave the apartment? I hope he does something interesting soon. Panic set in. I felt violated exposed in my own home. Someone had access to my living room and was broadcasting it to the world. I quickly shut down my computer and began tearing apart my apartment, searching for hidden cameras. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't find anything. No tiny lenses peeking out from behind picture frames. No suspicious wires leading to hidden recording devices. Nothing. It was as if the camera didn't exist yet the feed was undeniably real. I couldn't sleep that night. Every noise made me jump. Every shadow seemed like a lurking intruder. I checked the feed again, hoping it was some cruel joke, but there it was, still broadcasting my empty living room to hundreds of strangers. The next day at work, I was a zombie. My mind raced with questions. Who was doing this? Why? How long had it been going on? I couldn't focus on anything else. When I got home, I tried to act normal, though my paranoia was through the roof. I kept my laptop closed and refused to log back onto the dark web. Instead, I called a friend of mine, Jake, who was a bit of a tech wizard. I hesitated to tell him the full story, but eventually spilled everything, hoping he could help me figure out what was going on. Jake came over that evening, and together we scoured my apartment again. He brought over some specialized equipment to detect hidden cameras and bugs. Hours passed and still we found nothing. Finally, Jake suggested something that hadn't crossed my mind. What if the camera isn't in your apartment at all? What if it's accessing your devices somehow? It made sense. We went through my laptop, phone, and smart TV with a fine-toothed comb. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until Jake decided to check my router. He found some unusual traffic that didn't match any of my regular internet activities. This could be it, Jake said, his voice tense. Someone might be piggybacking off your network to stream the feed. 
Just as we thought we were getting somewhere, a notification popped up on my laptop. It was from an unknown email address. The subject line simply read, I see you. That's where I'm going to leave it for now, Reddit. I'll update you all as soon as I can. If anyone has any ideas or has experienced something similar, please let me know. I feel like I'm living in a nightmare and I don't know how to wake up. Username throwaway2345 posted on Reddit. Hey everyone, I promised an update and here it is. Things have only gotten weirder and I'm honestly not sure how much longer I can handle this. After receiving that ominous email, I was officially freaked out. It read, I see you, but there was no message body. Just those three words staring back at me like a sinister threat. Jake and I stared at the screen in silence for what felt like an eternity. Jake suggested we reset everything. The router, my devices, all passwords. We spent the next hour doing just that. He set up new security measures and recommended I avoid using my regular devices for anything personal for a while. It was a band-aid solution, but it made me feel a little better. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I covered my laptop camera and unplugged my smart TV, but the paranoia lingered. Every creak of the apartment seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat. Sleep was out of the question. The next morning, I decided to take a day off work. My mind wasn't in the right place, and I needed to figure this out. I spent the day researching cases similar to mine, hoping to find some pattern or solution. Most stories led to dead ends, filled with frustrated victims who never found the source of their intrusion. In the afternoon, I got a call from Jake. He'd been doing some digging of his own and found a thread on a dark web forum discussing a new kind of malware. This malware could turn everyday devices into surveillance tools, accessing cameras and microphones without any visible signs. It matched what was happening to me perfectly. Jake and I decided to dive back into the dark web, hoping to find more information. We found a user claiming to sell this malware and engaged in a cautious conversation. They were cryptic, asking for Bitcoin in exchange for details. It felt like a dead end until we stumbled upon another user, agent, who seemed to brag about their access to various live feeds, including ones like mine. We messaged agent, trying to play it cool, pretending to be interested buyers. After some back and forth, they sent us a link to a private chat. My hands were shaking as I clicked on it. The chat opened with a simple greeting. Hello, viewer. We asked how they accessed the feeds, and their response chilled me to the bone. Through your eyes, I felt a wave of nausea. Was this some kind of sick joke? Jake typed furiously, pressing for more details. Agent Zero claimed to have developed a program that could hijack any device connected to the internet, exploiting vulnerabilities most people didn't even know existed. They refused to give specifics, but hinted that once they had a foothold, they could access anything cameras, microphones, even the device's storage. I demanded to know why they were targeting me. The response was a link to the live feed of my living room still active, with over 300 viewers now. The chat exploded with excitement as I appeared on screen, staring at my own laptop. Panicking, I closed the chat and shut down my computer. Jake tried to calm me down, but I was spiraling. Someone out there was watching my every move, broadcasting my life to strangers for their twisted entertainment. Jake suggested one last thing, contacting the authorities. Reluctantly, I agreed. We gathered all the information we had and went to the police. They took my statement seriously, but their response was less than reassuring. Cybercrime cases like this were hard to track, especially when they originated from the dark web. They promised to investigate, but warned it could take time. Meanwhile, I was left in a state of constant anxiety. Every day was a struggle, wondering if my every move was being watched, scrutinized, and judged by faceless strangers. I started keeping my curtains closed and avoided using any devices unless absolutely necessary. The feeling of being a prisoner in my own home was unbearable. I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over, that the person behind this was still out there, watching and waiting. 
That's all I have for now, Reddit. I'll update again if anything changes. But for now, all I can do is wait and hope the police can find something. If anyone has any advice or has gone through something similar, please share. I feel like I'm losing my mind, and I don't know how much more I can take. Username, throwaway, 2345, posted on Reddit. Hey everyone, it's been a few days since my last update. Things have taken a turn, and I need to get this out. I hope you all can give me some advice or at least help me keep my sanity intact. After contacting the police, I tried to go about my daily life, but the paranoia was overwhelming. Every time I walked into my living room, I felt eyes on me. Even mundane activities like watching TV or making dinner became unbearable. The police had promised to investigate, but I could tell this wasn't a priority case for them. A week passed with no updates from the authorities. My anxiety levels skyrocketed. I couldn't sleep, couldn't focus on work, and I started avoiding my apartment as much as possible. One evening after another restless night, I decided I couldn't live like this anymore. I called Jake and told him my plan. I was going to move out, find a new place, and try to leave this nightmare behind. He agreed it was the best course of action, considering the circumstances. I spent the next few days searching for a new apartment, something small and nondescript where I could start fresh. Packing was a surreal experience. Every item I placed in a box felt tainted by the invasive eyes of whoever was watching. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting someone to jump out from the shadows. My nerves were frayed, and I just wanted to be done with it. On the day of the move, I took a drastic step. I decided to get rid of my laptop. It felt like the most significant link to whoever had been spying on me. I didn't trust simply wiping it clean or selling it. Instead, I took it to a nearby dumpster and threw it in, watching as it disappeared among the trash. It felt like a small victory, a step toward reclaiming my privacy. I moved into my new place, a tiny studio apartment on the other side of town. It was modest but felt like a fortress compared to my old place. No smart devices, no internet at first. Just me, some basic furniture, and a sense of relief. For a few days, things were calm. I still felt the lingering paranoia, but it was manageable. I avoided the internet and used an old flip phone for basic communication. It was like stepping back in time, but it gave me peace of mind. One night, however, I received a text message that shattered my fragile sense of security. It was from an unknown number, and it simply read, Nice new place. I nearly dropped my phone. My heart pounded in my chest as I looked around my new apartment, trying to spot anything out of place. How could they have found me? I had taken every precaution, left no digital trail. Frantically, I called Jake, explaining what had happened. He tried to calm me down, suggesting it might just be a coincidence, but we both knew better. Someone had found me, and they wanted me to know. That's where I am now, Reddit. I've moved, tried to start fresh, and yet... They're still watching. I don't know what to do next. I'm running out of options, and I feel like I'm trapped in a never-ending nightmare. If anyone has any advice or can help in any way, please, I'm begging you. I can't live like this anymore. Username, throwaway, 2345, posted on Reddit. Hey Reddit, it's time for another update. Things have escalated, and I'm not sure what to do anymore. Here's what's happened since my last post. After receiving that chilling text message, I knew I had to take more drastic measures. Moving wasn't enough. Whoever was behind this had a way to track me, and I needed to disappear completely for a while. I decided to get rid of all my technology I packed up my remaining devices, phone, tablet, even my TV, and donated them to a local thrift store. I didn't want any digital ties that could be exploited. With nothing but basic necessities, I made a decision to retreat to my family's mountain cabin. It's an old, isolated place with no electricity, no internet, and no cell service. 
the perfect place to escape and hopefully regain some sanity. I packed up my car and drove out there, leaving behind any traceable technology. The drive to the cabin was long and winding, through dense forests and up steep hills. As I got closer, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The cabin was exactly as I remembered it, rustic and secluded. I unloaded my supplies and settled in, feeling safer than I had in weeks. The first few days at the cabin were blissfully quiet. I spent my time hiking, reading old paperbacks, and enjoying the peace and solitude. The paranoia that had gripped me started to loosen its hold. I felt like I was finally starting to breathe again. However, after about a week, strange things began to happen. I started noticing small, unsettling changes around the cabin. Items were moved, doors left ajar, and I could swear I heard footsteps outside at night. At first, I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me, the residual paranoia from the past weeks. But then one morning, I found a note on the front porch. It simply read, You can't hide. My heart sank. How had they found me here? This place was off the grid, completely isolated. I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I was miles away from any help, with no way to contact anyone. My only option was to hunker down and hope whoever was tormenting me would lose interest. I fortified the cabin as best as I could, securing windows and doors, and kept a knife by my bed for some semblance of protection. Days turned into weeks, and the feeling of being watched never went away. Every noise outside sent me into a panic. Every shadow seemed to harbor a threat. I barely slept, jumping at every sound. The sense of safety I had initially felt was completely gone. Then, one night, I woke to the sound of someone trying to open the front door. I grabbed my knife and crept down the stairs, heart pounding. The door rattled again, but then fell silent. I waited, breath held, for what felt like an eternity before daring to look outside. No one was there, but the feeling of dread was suffocating. The next morning I found another note. Leaving won't help, it read. I was terrified, trapped in a nightmare with no end in sight. I needed to get out of there, but I had no idea where to go. I packed up my things and decided to leave the cabin. I didn't have a plan, just a desperate need to get away. As I drove down the mountain, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed, that no matter where I went, they would always find me. That's where I am now, Reddit. I'm back on the road, trying to find a place to hide, but I don't know how much longer I can keep running. Username, throwaway12345, posted on Reddit. Hey Reddit, this is my final update. I hope sharing my story helps someone else out there because I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. After leaving the cabin, I realized that staying in one place made me an easy target. Whoever was tracking me had resources and determination far beyond anything I could comprehend. I decided the only way to stay safe was to keep moving, never staying in one place for too long. I started living out of my car driving from town to town, staying in cheap motels and avoiding any place where I could be easily found. I paid for everything in cash, kept my head down, and never used any technology that could give away my location. The first few weeks on the road were nerve-wracking. I constantly felt like I was being followed, always glancing in the rearview mirror and checking for any signs of pursuit. I avoided major highways, taking back roads and less traveled routes to stay off the radar. Despite my best efforts, there were times when I felt like they were still watching. I'd find notes slipped under motel room doors or see strange cars parked nearby that seemed to linger too long. It felt like a game of cat and mouse, and I was always one step away from being caught. I tried to reach out to Jake a few times, but without a phone or reliable internet access, it was nearly impossible to maintain contact. I left him cryptic messages at prearranged locations hoping he'd understand my situation. He did his best to offer support and advice, but we both knew my situation was dire. One night in a small town somewhere in the Midwest, I woke up to the sound of someone trying to pick the lock on my motel room door. I grabbed my things and slipped out the back window, heart racing. 
I drove through the night, not stopping until I was several states away. That was the moment I realized there was no end to this. I could keep running, but they would always find me. My life had become a never-ending cycle of fear and flight. I had to accept that this was my new reality. Now I never stay in one place for more than a few days. I've become adept at blending in, making myself invisible. I've learned to survive on minimal resources, avoiding any habits or routines that could give away my location. I don't know who they are or why they chose me, but I've come to terms with the fact that I may never find out. My only goal now is to stay ahead of them, to keep moving and stay alive. If anyone out there has any advice or knows a way to truly disappear, please share. I'm desperate for any help I can get. And if you're reading this, whoever you are, know that I won't stop fighting. I may be on the run, but I'm not giving up. Stay safe, Reddit. And remember, if you ever feel like you're being watched, trust your instincts. You might just be right. I've always been a bit of a tech nerd. Not in the hacker sense, but more of the knows how to fix your computer type. I spent a lot of my free time online, mostly exploring forums and obscure parts of the internet. It was on one of these nights, deep into the rabbit hole of the web, that I stumbled across something truly disturbing. It started innocuously enough. I was on Reddit, scrolling through some of my usual haunts, our unresolved mysteries, our internet mysteries, and a few tech forums. Someone had posted a link to a dark web forum, claiming it was a treasure trove of unsolved mysteries and hidden knowledge. My curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to dive in. Navigating the dark web isn't as easy as opening a browser and typing in a URL. It requires a special browser, like Tor, and a good VPN. After setting up, I finally accessed the link. It led to a forum called The Abyss, which lived up to its name. The interface was crude and almost archaic, but the content was what mattered. Most of it was the usual conspiracy theory nonsense, but one thread caught my eye. It was titled, Crucifix 6, A New Order. The post had been made by a user named Lucifer's Hand, and it was long, much longer than most posts on the site. I started reading, expecting the usual rants about the Illuminati or some obscure government project. What I found was far more unsettling. The post detailed the formation of a group called Crucifix 666, a satanic cult that aimed to bring about a new world order through rituals and sacrifices. It sounded absurd, but what caught my attention was the sheer number of replies and the apparent seriousness with which people were discussing it. These weren't just trolls having fun. These were people who genuinely believed in this cult's mission. The more I read, the more horrified I became. Users were sharing ritual practices, recruitment strategies, and even locations for their gatherings. There were references to ancient texts and symbols, and users discussed the power they believed they could harness through these rituals. It was all incredibly detailed and disturbingly seemed well organized. I spent hours that night reading through the thread. Each post was more bizarre and unsettling than the last. There were accounts doing some kind of blood rituals and the use of certain symbols to mark new members. The most chilling part was the evidence. People were sharing photos, blurry and grainy, but enough to convey a sense of reality. There were images of altars, symbols drawn in what looked like blood. I don't know, maybe it was paint, God knows. What it was. There was also posts about gatherings in dark wooded areas. Despite my growing unease, I couldn't stop reading. It was like watching a train wreck in slow motion. I needed to understand how these people could believe in something so twisted. Then, I came across a post that sent a shiver down my spine. A user named Sacred Blood shared a detailed account of a ritual they had performed, claiming it had given them the power to control others. The replies were full of people asking for details, eager to try it themselves. At this point, I decided I had to dig deeper. I created an account using a throwaway email and username. I made my first post, asking about the origins of Crucifix 666 and how it had started. The response was immediate. 
Within minutes, I had several replies, mostly welcoming me to the community. One user, Dark Priest, sent me a private message, inviting me to a more secure chat room to discuss the cult further. Against my better judgment, I accepted the invitation. The chat room was even more unsettling. There were about 20 active users, all discussing the cult's activities in real time. They talked about upcoming gatherings, new recruits, and plans to expand their influence. The most active user was Lucifer's Hand, who seemed to be the leader or at least one of the top figures in the group. Over the next few days, I spent more time in the chat room, trying to learn as much as I could. I was careful not to reveal too much about myself, always playing the part of an interested outsider. The more I learned, the more real it all became. These people weren't just playing pretend, they genuinely believed in their cause and were committed to seeing it through. One night I received a private message from Lucifer's Hand. He invited me to a gathering they were having the following week, promising it would be an eye-opening experience. He gave me the location, a remote area in the woods about an hour's drive from my town. I knew I couldn't go, but I was terrified by the invitation. These people were real, and they were close. I spent the next few days in a state of paranoia. I kept checking the forum and chat room, trying to see if anyone was talking about me or if they suspected I was an outsider. Every time I heard a strange noise or saw an unfamiliar car in the neighborhood, my heart would race. I knew I needed to do something, but I wasn't sure what. Part one of this story ends here but the events that followed were even more disturbing. The deeper I got, the more I realized that Crucifix 666 was more than just a group of misguided individuals. They were a growing threat, and their influence was spreading. After the invitation from Lucifer's hand, my fear and paranoia skyrocketed. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that every shadow hid someone from Crucifix 66. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I couldn't handle this alone. I had to tell someone, so I gathered all the evidence I could. I took screenshots of the forum posts, chat logs, and the disturbing photos they shared. I printed everything out and compiled it into a folder. With a deep breath and a heavy heart, I decided to go to the police. Walking into the station, I felt a mix of anxiety and relief. Finally, I was going to do something about this madness. I approached the front desk and explained to the officer that I had evidence of a dangerous cult operating in the area. The officer, a middle-aged man with a tired look in his eyes, raised an eyebrow but took me seriously enough to lead me to an interview room. I sat down and waited for what felt like an eternity. Eventually, a detective walked in, introducing himself as Detective Harris. He had a friendly demeanor, which put me at ease. I handed him the folder and began explaining everything, how I found the group, what they were doing, and the invitation to the gathering. Detective Harris flipped through the folder, his expression changing from curiosity to mild amusement. When he reached the photos, he let out a small chuckle. Look, I appreciate you bringing this in, he said, closing the folder and setting it on the table. But these are just a bunch of online trolls. They get their kicks from scaring people like you. I've seen this before. I was stunned. But these people are serious, I insisted. They believe in this stuff. They're performing rituals and they invited me to a gathering. Detective Harris sighed. I get it. The internet is a strange place and it can be hard to tell what's real and what's not. But without concrete evidence of a real threat, there's not much we can do. We can't just go after every group that claims to be a cult online. I felt a surge of frustration. So, you're just going to ignore this? What if someone gets hurt? He looked at me sympathetically. If you hear about any real-world crimes or if they contact you directly and threaten you, then we can step in. Until then... My advice is to stay away from those sites and be careful online. Feeling defeated, I left the station. The police weren't going to help, and I was back to square one. The only thing I could do was stay vigilant and try to avoid any further contact with Crucifix 666.
but curiosity has a way of pulling you back in, even when you know it's dangerous. Over the next few days, I kept an eye on the forum and chat room, hoping to gather more evidence. The members continued to post about their activities, sharing details about their rituals and recruitment. It was clear they were serious, and their numbers seemed to be growing. One night, I received another private message from Lucifer's hand. He asked if I was coming to the gathering, saying it would be a chance to truly see the light. I knew I couldn't ignore this. I had to find a way to stop them, but I needed more help. That's when I decided to reach out to a friend of mine, Jake, who was a bit of a conspiracy theorist and an amateur hacker. I knew if anyone could help me get more information, it was him. We met at a local coffee shop, and I told him everything. Jake was intrigued, to say the least. He agreed to help me, and we started working together to dig deeper into crucifix. What we found was even more disturbing. The group was well organized, with members all over the country. They had a hierarchy, and Lucifer's hand was one of the leaders. We also found references to another gathering, this one much larger and more secretive. It was scheduled to happen in a few months, and it seemed to be some sort of initiation ceremony for new members. We knew we had to find out more, and if possible, stop it. Jake and I knew that to truly understand the threat posed by Crucifix 66, we needed to see their activities firsthand. The initiation ceremony for new members was the perfect opportunity. After much deliberation, we decided to infiltrate it. We managed to get the details of the event through our continued surveillance of the group's communications. The location was a remote farmhouse far from any prying eyes. We needed disguises, so we procured the required robes. They were black with crimson linings and had a distinctive symbol embroidered on the chest, a twisted version of a crucifix with the number 666 beneath it. The night of the ceremony, we drove out to the farmhouse, our nerves taut with tension. As we approached, the sight was eerie. The farmhouse was illuminated by torches, casting long, flickering shadows. We parked a distance away and walked the rest of the way, slipping into the crowd unnoticed. There were about 60 people gathered, all wearing the same dark robes. The ceremony began with a speech from Lucifer's hand, who stood on a makeshift altar. He spoke passionately about their beliefs, invoking the name of Satan and promising power and enlightenment to the faithful. The crowd responded with fervent cheers, their enthusiasm chilling. Then came the ritual, we were led into a circle and instructed to kneel. Candles were lit, and the air was thick with the scent of incense. Lucifer's hand moved around the circle, chanting in a language I didn't recognize. Suddenly, he produced a ceremonial dagger and announced that each new member must offer a drop of their blood to seal their commitment. My heart pounded as he approached, the dagger glinting ominously in the firelight. I exchanged a quick, fearful glance with Jake. This was too much. We hadn't signed up for actual blood rituals. As Lucifer's hand reached us, Jake and I sprang to our feet, shoving our way through the crowd. Chaos erupted. Shouts of anger and confusion filled the air as we bolted towards the woods. We heard footsteps pounding behind us, and panic fueled our flight. The dark forest was a maze, branches clawing at us as we ran, but we didn't dare stop. Behind us, the cult members were in hot pursuit, their torches casting a flickering light that seemed to close in from all sides. My lungs burned and my legs felt like lead, but adrenaline pushed us onward. We stumbled over roots and rocks, our only goal to escape. After what felt like an eternity, we broke through the tree line and saw the faint outline of our car. We threw ourselves into it, Jake fumbling with the keys. The engine roared to life and we sped away, leaving the cult members behind. I glanced back, half expecting them to appear out of the darkness, but they were nowhere to be seen. We drove in silence for a long time, too shaken to speak. Finally, we pulled over to catch our breath and process what had just happened. We had infiltrated Crucifix. Six, and barely escaped with our lives. It was clear now just how dangerous this group was.
After our narrow escape from the initiation ceremony, Jake and I decided it was safest to stick together for a while. We both took time off work and stayed at my place, the doors locked and the curtains drawn. We spent our days trying to unwind, but the tension was palpable. We knew that it was only a matter of time before Crucifix 66 came looking for us. Three days passed without incident, but on the fourth day, things took a terrifying turn. That morning, Jake was browsing the dark web, keeping tabs on the forum and chat room activity, when he found something that made his blood run cold. There were new posts about us, pictures taken during the ceremony and detailed descriptions of our escape. They know who we are, Jake said, his voice barely above a whisper. Look at this. He showed me the screen. There, plastered all over the dark web, were pictures of us from the night of the ceremony, our faces clearly visible. Accompanying the images were messages from members of Crucifix 6666, urging others to find and bring us back for judgment. Panic surged through me. They had our faces and they knew we were witnesses to their rituals. It was only a matter of time before they tracked us down. We needed a plan and fast. We can't stay here, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. We need to leave. Go somewhere they can't find us. Jake nodded. Agreed. But first, we should gather all the evidence we've collected and send it to someone who can help. Maybe if we expose them, it will be harder for them to operate. We spent the next few hours compiling everything, screenshots, chat logs, photos, and our accounts of the ceremony. We sent the files to several journalists and organizations dedicated to exposing cults and criminal activities. It was a long shot, but it was the best we could do under the circumstances. With that done, we packed a few essentials and hit the road. We decided to head to a secluded cabin owned by Jake's uncle, several hours away in the mountains. It was isolated, with no internet or cell service which we hoped would keep us off the radar. The drive was tense. Every car that seemed to follow us for too long, every unfamiliar face we saw, made our hearts race. We finally reached the cabin just as the sun was setting. It was small and rustic, but it felt like a fortress compared to the vulnerability we felt in the city. For the first time in days, we allowed ourselves to relax, if only a little. The quiet of the mountains was a stark contrast to the chaos we had been thrown into. We spent the evening by the fireplace trying to process everything that had happened. That night, sleep was elusive. Every creak of the cabin, every rustle of the wind outside made us jump. The reality of being hunted by a cult was something neither of us had ever imagined facing. As the days passed, we stayed vigilant, taking turns keeping watch and only venturing outside for necessities. One evening, as we were preparing dinner, we heard the unmistakable sound of a car engine approaching. Panic gripped us. We peered out the window and saw a dark sedan slowly making its way up the dirt road toward the cabin. They found us, Jake whispered, his face pale. We need to get out of here now. We grabbed our bags and slipped out the back door, disappearing into the dense forest behind the cabin. We moved quickly and quietly, putting as much distance between us and the cabin as possible. We didn't stop until we were deep in the woods, far from any paths or roads. Breathless and exhausted, we found a spot to rest. The darkness of the forest felt suffocating, but it was our only protection. We knew we couldn't stay in one place for long. The cult was relentless and they wouldn't stop until they found us. As Jake and I huddled in the dark forest, exhaustion and fear weighed heavily on us. We knew we couldn't keep running forever. The cult was relentless and resourceful, and it was only a matter of time before they caught up with us again. We needed a plan, and we needed it fast. After much deliberation, we decided to take a desperate gamble. Jake managed to establish a secure line of communication with Lucifer's hand. We proposed a truce, we would give them a large sum of money in exchange for our safety and their promise to leave us alone. It was a risky move, but we were out of options. The reply came swiftly. Lucifer's hand was intrigued by our offer and agreed to meet us at a neutral location to discuss the terms. The meeting was set for the next night 
in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of a nearby town. The drive to the warehouse was filled with tension. We arrived early and waited, the silence between us heavy with anxiety. Just as we were beginning to doubt if they would show, a convoy of cars pulled up. Several members of Crucifix 666 emerged, including Lucifer's hand. He approached us with a cold, calculating gaze. You have the money? He asked. I nodded and handed over a locked briefcase. He opened it, inspected the contents, and nodded in satisfaction. This is sufficient. You have my word that we will leave you alone. But remember, if you ever speak of us or attempt to interfere again, there will be no place you can hide. We nodded, relief washing over us as we realized we might finally be free from this nightmare. Lucifer's hand motioned to his followers, and they turned to leave. As they walked away, a weight lifted from my shoulders. It was over. Jake and I drove back in silence, the reality of what we had just done sinking in. We had bought our freedom, but at a significant cost. The money was a secret between us, a price we were willing to pay for our lives and peace of mind. Back home, we slowly began to rebuild our lives. The paranoia gradually faded, though the memories of our encounter with Crucifix, 66, remained. We stayed vigilant, always aware of the potential danger, but hopeful that the cult would honor their agreement. Months passed without incident. We never heard from Crucifix 666 again. The files we had sent to journalists and organizations seemed to have had some impact, as the group's online presence dwindled and their activities became less frequent. 